we humans look really different from most other animals and I'm sure you agree with me on that. Be it cows, be it rabbits or dogs, we look different from them and they all look different from each other. So if I ask you, is there any animal that uh, could be said to even remotely resemble us? I'm sure you'll say chimps and you're right. Chimpanzees can be considered to be our closest living relative. Our species, the Homo sapiens, the single remaining member of the genus Homo. Our good old buddies, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens idaltu and Homo neanderthalensis kicked the bucket a long, long time ago. They are extinct. Now, what I want you to do is meet Wilma, named after the redhead Flintstones character, I'm sure you know her, the first model of a Neanderthal based in part on ancient DNA evidence. Artists and scientists actually created Wilma using analysis of DNA from 43,000 year old bones that had been cannibalized. Announced uh, sometime in October, I think 2007, the findings had suggested that at least some Neanderthals would have had red hair, pale skin and possibly freckles like this. Humans are a different species and a specific species that is different from all other types of organisms. So what's special about us that makes us humans? For starters, we don't have a lot of hair or fur on our body, right? And then we're able to stand up and walk really straight. We don't have sharp canines and we get to have this big, colossal, huge brain that helps you do really awesome stuff like, like solve complicated math problem, talk real well, walk real well, do really naughty stuff and also let you get away with it. This is something, say, a dog uh, has to deal with. Now, remember that I said chimps and us are relatives, but are we close enough relatives to be of the same species? The answer, I'm sure, to your great relief is no. We aren't of the same species. We are of the same family. And though you may think that family is the closest relation that there can be, uh, it happens that in science, there are two sub-levels of closeness, okay? Uh, that is genus and species. So humans belong to the genus Homo and the species Homo sapiens. Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus are of the same genus but of different species. The only known other Homo sapiens species, which is Homo sapiens idaltu, uh, elderwise human is the translation, is again extinct, which makes us Homo sapiens sapiens the only living member of the genus Homo and the only living member of the species Homo sapiens. So I'm going to talk about the story of the human evolution, the most interesting story that there is, but that's in a bit. For now, let me ask you, a very critical question, which I'm sure you're thinking, how can you tell that two organisms belong to the same species? I actually know the answer to this one. If a group of organisms can interbreed to produce fertile offspring, they are said to belong to the same species. A typical example is what happened to Darwin's finches on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, the distinctly different beaks that developed because of the different type of food available on each island isolated these species so much and led uh, to the formation of different species of finches. The next type is called sympatric speciation. Sympatric means same country, which effectively means that these guys hang out in close proximity of each other, but they do not breed. And why? Because they do not breed, there is no gene flow and slowly and steadily these become independent species. Now, let's answer why. This can happen due to a change in the chromosomal number seen mostly in plants. Uh, for example, diploid plants can get polyploid. That is, if there were two pairs of chromosomes, it gets changed to three or four. So this is a drastic change and because of this change, crossing cannot happen. And then you have two more types. Peripatric and parapatric speciation, they sound similar, right? Both are a kind of an extension of allopatric speciation in the sense that a kind of niche population is created that can either be isolated over time from the main population or just adjacent to the main population. The first type is called peripatric because peri means near and the second type is called parapatric because para means beside or adjacent. This kind of speciation happens because of geographical boundaries as well. One difference is that this new species will have a lower number of members compared to the species it evolved from. Uh, it's kind of like a niche being created of the new species. It can happen due to severe climatic changes like drought or a majority of the initial population or species in an area being wiped out. Take for example, the evolution 
of the polar bear from the brown bear and if i were to ask you what is the color of the hair of the polar bear would you say white most of you would say white right because that's what you see that's what you clearly see but that's wrong you see white because it's white all around the polar bear in fact there is absolutely no color for the hair of a polar bear sources indicate that the long coarse guard hairs which protect the plush thick undercoat are hollow and transparent did you even know that the thinner hairs of the undercoat are not hollow but they like the guard hairs are colorless now the hair of a polar bear looks white because the air spaces in each hair scatter light of all colors the color white becomes visible to our eyes when an object reflects back all of the visible wavelengths of light rather than absorbing some of the wavelengths very very interesting now scientists in the late 1970s discovered another interesting tidbit about polar bears a number of polar bears in zoos from around the world were turning green these scientists discovered that the algae responsible for making the bears green were not on the surface of the hair as originally supposed but were inside the hair and can you guess what's the color of their skin colorless again no white no it's black yes black and then there is 4.5 cm of fat below that no wonder these guys walk on snow without feeling even a teeny weeny bit cold right mummy polar bears are very reluctant to take their cubbies along with them for a swim because of the same reason the hair is a bad insulator the fat layer is what insulates and the cubs don't have such thick layers so so protective the four types of speciation we just spoke about are because of geographies but speciation can also happen because of behavioral changes or differences seen in different animals say one bird type starts hanging out in the day the other one starts hanging out in the night they don't get to meet though they are in the same area and because of this they don't get together and have babies now one big example would be the orcanus orca or killer whales found in different parts of the world including those near the canadian vancouver islands Argentinian waters, New Zealand waters, etc., etc. Most of the studies have been done near the Canadian waters. Now, these orcas probably got their exaggerated reputation as killer whales from reports of them viciously ripping apart marine animals, including large whales, to shreds. And surprisingly, however, till date, there are no known cases of orcas eating or even harming a human. There are two types of whales that occur at this region the resident whales and the transient whales which live in such close proximity to each other but they do not interbreed the big question is why the answer lies in the fact that both these groups show huge and clear variations in feeding styles predating behavior and other behavior which possibly resulted in them getting isolated from each other over time in their appearances there is a subtle difference uh, in the fin shape and the saddle color otherwise they look almost the same now they sound different as well they move about differently and they have very 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 different diets Transient whales or the killer whales are generally comprised of an adult female and two or three of her offspring. Among the differences between residents and transients, tr- uh, resident orcas of both sexes stay within shouting distance of their mothers their entire lives. Only first-born male transients maintain such intense fidelity to their mothers. Optimum pod size for transients is three. So whenever a third offspring is born, one of the sibling often leaves. This rule seems to be. that uh, the eldest son can stay but all of the others or one of the others may have to actually go uh, very strange but true now both types of whales have no predators and are capable of ingesting virtually any bite sized tidbit or living thing found in the ocean but residents very very choosy select only fish and not just any fish they are very fussy eaters they eat mainly a special salmon called chinook salmon and maybe a squid now and then while transients never touch fish fish and squid they prey exclusively on sea sea lions dolphins and other large whales transients are silent killers and move about very very silently they silently stalk and outwit their you know very food zigzagging in unpredictable patterns with residents 
they are like the party hard kind of creatures make a lot more noise residents often seem to celebrate festive occasions and gathering of pods with repeated breeches tail bobs cartwheels pie hops accompanied by a wide variety of vocalizations or shouting they're so so different both these different kinds of whales these differences probably made these two whales uh, you know drift apart then drift apart far enough so that there's no gene flow between them isolating them even though they shared practically the same very same water and there is a debate about the killer whales are they an example for sympatric speciation as well because they occur in the same space but you know what i've put them under behavioral speciation because the reason for the speciation is majorly because of their behavior you can also take it as an example for sympatric speciation because they're effectively in the same place there are some frogs that breed during spring and some during winter and because of this they are not able to interbreed and you can say the time of mating doesn't match and since t is for time t is for temporal this is called temporal isolation the second part is very important highlight it underline it the organisms need to produce fertile offspring now you must be thinking which organism doesn't produce fertile offspring or isn't it just enough that two organisms can produce babies but you know what turns out that it's not enough it's important that those babies are able to produce babies too uh, so it sometimes happens that two organisms of different species can technically have a baby take for example the mule who has a donkey for a father and a horse for a mother the mules cannot breed and produce offspring donkeys and horses don't even have the same number of chromosomes so even though donkeys and horses can technically get together and produce baby mules mules don't even have the genetic information that is required to produce sex cells and hence cannot have baby mules so donkeys and horses are of different species uh, i'll give you another example and that would be of the noble liger which is produced from a male lion and a female tiger now lions and tigers have the same number of chromosomes but still when they get together and have a liger cub the liger cub will turn out to be infertile ligers or baby lion tiger mashup if you like to call it that are much bigger than both their parents but at the end of it they cannot reproduce because lions and tigers are of different species ligers and mules are examples of hybrids offsprings that are produced when two different species interbreed now that you understood how you can identify if two organisms are of the same species let's understand how two species have come into being or formed and the process when two species are formed is called speciation The Hawaiian Islands are home to some of the most stunning examples of speciation. Over one thousand species of fruit fly have developed here and are found nowhere else on Earth. Now, two different species can form, or speciation can happen due to four different natural reasons. One is allopatric speciation. Now, allopatric speciation happens because two groups of organisms get separated over time due to geographies. Allo means different in Greek, and patric means place or country, so different country. Say an island broke off into two parts. Of course, birds can fly from one uh, island to the other one, but rodents cannot. Or uh, a river came in between, and the width kept on and on and on increasing. Organisms on both sides of the river would separate, and based on the climatic conditions, they would adapt themselves. to their respective environment now let's take another example see it's really really cold on one side of this big crevice or canyon i'll take squirrels for an example okay they will have nice thick fur coats big bushy tails and will have more layers of fat to keep them nice and warm and keep them adjusted to this kind of a climate on the other side it's a different story it's like a desert so the squirrels here have shed some fur and they've shed some fat and some hair have got thinner tails and then develop some sweat glands because it's quite quite hot out here so what starts happening the respective squirrels start passing their genes down future generations and thick coat ones produce babies with thick coats the ones with thin coats if at all present by chance find it very very difficult to survive in cold conditions and slowly the gene for thick coats becomes dominant and because of natural selection almost all the squirrels on this side look like this and all the squirrels on the other side look like this they do not interbreed because they are geographically separated 
and slowly and slowly they become a different species.